Hello, everybody. This is Grandmaster Eugene Perlstein for iChess.net. And today I want to share with you an unbelievable game by Vishwanathan Anand. Of course, Anand needs no introduction. He is a former world champion. He won so many tournaments that we already probably lost count. And nevertheless, he is still one of the top 10 players in the world, even in his age. And he is definitely not a young chicken anymore. So in this game, I want to show you that Anand is a very universal player and he is an incredible positional player as well as a gifted attacker. And this is a World Chess Championship match game in 2010 against another super GM, Veselin Topalov from Bulgaria. So in this uh, 2010 World Championship, this was actually a very dramatic um, event for Anand where he managed to win the last round with Black to clinch his title, to defend his title. But the game is from an earlier round and we're going to see an opening called the Catalan. And if you're a big fan of the Catalan, I highly recommend that you study this game. So after the moves d4, knight f6, c4, e6, knight f3, d5, g3. This is the starting position of the Catalan opening. And the idea is very simple. White delays the pressure at the, for the center until the middle game. White's going to put the bishop on g2, castle. And this bishop on g2 is going to put this tremendous pressure on the long diagonal. And this counterpart on c8 most always is usually stuck there. And it's very difficult to develop that bishop. So black has several plans against the Catalan. The most popular move is bishop b4 check. And Tapalov actually took the pawn. He was a really ambitious move. Now, I should mention that after bishop b4 check, white has a number of ways to play here. The most popular way is to simply block with the bishop. This is quite an interesting try. Knight bd2, which is gaining popularity lately. And even the move knight c3, this is the true pawn sacrifice. White's going to have a hard time gaining that pawn back is another way to play. So in the game, Topolov took the pawn, bishop g2. Notice that white is not in a hurry to win the pawn back. If you play queen a4 check, followed by queen takes pawn, you're wasting precious time. In the meantime, black can activate the bishop and try to neutralize this powerful bishop on g2. This is really the only big advantage that white has. So that's why um, Anand played bishop g2, bishop b4 check. Another question for white, how are you going to block? You have the knight c3 move, bishop d2 move, knight bd2 move, and Anand plays bishop d2, which is a logical move because if you think about that, this is a strong bishop, potentially protector of the king side if the bishop is placed on e7. And this bishop is so much superior to this bishop so that white doesn't mind the trade of the dark square bishops. a5. This is a trendy line back in the day, although I think this game shows that it's a very risky line as well as Anand played here. White has several moves here. White can simply castle. White can play knight c3. Or the move that Anand played, queen c2. Vishy has prepared this variation at home. Keep in mind, world championship match is a big deal. Both players are following their home preparation. And that's another big advantage that Anand has over his peers back in the day. He had unbelievable preparation. I think his win against Kramnik and this match win against Topolov really showed that he does his homework well. So let's see what happened next. Bishop takes. And here we come to an interesting decision by White. Normally, we would take with the knight, developing the piece and attacking the pawn. But Vishik had other plans. Queen takes d2, very interesting move. I'm not sure if you guys would even consider a move like that because now the knight has kind of stayed back and the pawn is not even there under attack. But 
White had a very deep idea that I will show you later. I should mention that if you take with a knight, black's probably going to play b5. And if you try to play knight e5, well, black has different plans. Black can even try to get the rook out of the way. The position is double-edged. Knight d5 is an interesting try. Definitely playable, but not what white had in mind here. So let's see what happened in the game. Queen takes. And now c6. So Topolov is really going to try to prove the point that I've got the extra pawn. He wants to play b5. With the extra c pawn, he's really going to say to white, where is your compensation? And I will show you that Anand really had a deep idea in mind here. a4. This is a very strong idea. Now that you put the pawn on b5, white's always going to be threatening to take the pawn. And after pawn takes, to do this covered attack on the rook. And this is the point behind the move a4. This is all home preparation. b5 anyways. And now a very tricky move. Knight a3. You guys are probably taught that knights should be developed toward the center. Yet every rule has an exception. As Vicious says that the pressure against the b pawn. Keep in mind black never wants to take or play b4 because the c pawn is about to fall. Black really needs to babysit this b5 pawn long term, which will give white to create a fundamentally powerful attack on the king. And that's the theme of today's video that Anand will show you how to win spectacular. Even though it looks like this king side is absolutely safe for the moment, Anand really has some deep ideas in mind. So bishop d7, logical move, protecting the c pawn and indirectly the b5 pawn. Knight e5. We already discussed this idea. This is a very typical idea in the Catalan. You occupy this powerful outpost and you open up the monster bishop on g2. Nevertheless, white is still down a pawn. So the big threat now is to take on b5 using the pin on the c6 pawn. So Topalov stops it with knight d5. e4, another thematic move. White wins the center and shows black that his space advantage may prove very important long term. So where should the knight go? Well, the logical square rather than going all the way back to uh, b6 or c7 is to play b4. And you don't ask an active player topple of twice to play an active move. Knight b4 is what he really wants to play. And the knight's put in pressure on d3 and on c2. Honestly, though, you will see that for the rest of the game, this knight is going to be cut off and the attack will be much swifter for white. Castles, castles. So let's pause here and try to sort of step back and evaluate this position. Clearly, black is a pawn up. That's one kind of obvious advantage. So under no circumstances does white want to trade pieces. If you trade pieces, go to an end game, you simply will lose. But black has many other problems. For instance, this bishop on d7, honestly, um, looking at the pawn on the e pawn, looks like a big fat pawn. I don't really see any future for that bishop. The knight on b8 is also kind of stuck. The knight cannot really go to c6 or d7, and a6 and is not really such a great square. So overall, the pawn is extra, but the pieces are poorly placed. Now, what does white have? Well, white has this beautiful center, the two central pawn, beautiful outpost for the knight. The space advantage, the very powerful bishop that could join the party at any moment. The only piece that's kind of out of the game is this knight on a3, but the knight has an important function. Together with the a pawn, they're putting pressure on the b5 pawn. I would say white's position is easier to play. And white is not in a hurry because black is cramped. I really like Anna's next move, rook f to d1. So when you're down material and your opponent's pieces are kind of stuck and awkward, don't automatically try to gain the material back or simplify it. Simply by putting pressure in your opponent's position, white is improving his pieces. So now this battery, the queen and the rook, potentially could break through with a thematic d5 pawn push. Black really needs to watch out for it. And I think that's why Topolov played bishop to e8. He's getting ready for the push. Here it comes. d5 x-clan. 
breaking open the position. When your opponent has most of their pieces on the back rank, the coordination is lacking. And the bishop needs to be opened up. I think this is perfect timing. Very good move by white. Taking on d5 is extremely risky. That is why Topolov plays queen to d6. So the knight's under attack. Now, of course, the knight can simply go back to f3, but when you have the initiative, you don't want to retreat. I like this idea, knight g4. This is not just a retreating move. The knight is going to be eyeing the king. We are transferring the pieces closer to the king, to the enemy king. It's still, right now, it doesn't look like there is an attack. Yet the central breakthrough with e5 and d6 looks like it's going to put black under serious pressure. This pretty much forces black's next move. Queen c5, getting out of the way. And knight e3, redirecting the knight, putting pressure on the d5 pawn, once again protecting this very powerful pawn. Knight comes to a6, black's trying to finish development. Both sides are playing good logical chess. And here comes d takes c6. With this kind of exchange, white's gonna gain some very powerful open files. So pawn takes a4. Of course, you could have taken with the bishop, but then he didn't like pawn takes, bishop takes, knight takes c4, bishop takes, and now one of the most important concepts in chess, the pin. Here comes rook a to c1, and the bishop cannot be saved. If I need to, I can always put more pressure with b3. But honestly, simple, either rook takes or knight takes, will give white an easy advantage. It's a slight advantage. Maybe black should have gone for it nevertheless. But Tapalov is still looking for counter chances. He's not ready to kind of settle for defending his position and passive play. So that's why he took on a4. He's still quite ambitious in this game. Knight takes and bishop takes. At the end of the day, we have a little bit of simplification. Black has the extra pawn, but it is a doubled pawn, and white's pieces will swiftly turn to the king side. Now the next move is rook a to c1, h6, and knight d6 exclaim, setting up the discover attack on the queen. Queen backs up, and knight g4 right back. And now we can clearly see the attack is taking place. Let's split the board on the king side, along the d-file, and on the queen side. And count the pieces, how many attackers and how many defenders. Well, these pawns don't even count as pieces defending the king. So really there's only one defender, that rook on f8. So that's very little, right guys? On the other hand, white has this knight, the queen, the knight on d6, and both rooks can join the party quickly because of the control of the open file. When you have more attackers than defenders by margin, look for sacrifices. And after the move, rook a to d8, you can probably already try to guess white's next move. So if you need more time, go ahead and pause the video and try to work things out. This is very instructive, but I think you may already be onto something. Look at the queen, look at the knight, look at the king, these pawns, are the only defenders which could easily be destroyed. And here comes very beautiful peace sacrifice. Spectacular attack begins. Knight takes check. Well, you gotta really take the knight. Pawn takes, queen takes. So what do we have now? There's no forced mate yet, but nevertheless, the king is totally naked, so to say, and white wants to play e5 and probably very simply swing one of the rooks over. I really like the idea of rook c4, rook g4, and mate. Now what about these guys? They are mere spectators. There's no way they're gonna come to help out on the king side. What about the bishop on c6? Well, the bishop can't do much against this plan. Overall, black's position is under serious, serious danger. Well, we gotta give credit to Topal for finding defensive resources. He plays f6. This is a very clever idea to use this queen as the defender. So you see, black probably was hoping that this is the key move that stops white attack. But is he correct? Well, let's see what happens next. e5, x-clan. 
Still, the breakthrough begins. The bishops under attack from this guy and from this guy. So Topalov thinks, oh, I'm just going to trade the bishops. But remember, guys, chess is not checkers. What does that mean? You don't always have to take back. This move is not an autopilot move by any means. And I think this is what most kind of mistakes that people make whenever somebody takes your piece, you take it right back without even thinking. But here, white has a very powerful intermezzo, zwischenzug, or moving between. This concept is extremely important. Pawn takes f6. You may wonder, wait a second, wait a second. g7 is not even under attack. I've got the extra bishop. I'm simply going to play bishop to f3 and be up a piece. Well, is that so? I'm going to give you a minute here to see if you can figure out the winning idea for white. So again, don't think about defense. You, I know your rook's under attack. You may think about moving the rook out of the way, but no, forget about the rook. Focus on the enemy king. How can you attack the king? So the first idea that comes to your mind is probably the move f7, right? Well, unfortunately, it's not really checkmate. The rook can be taken on f7, and after knight takes, I can take with check, and it's not actually immediate checkmate. Much simpler win is simply this check. King h8, and now f7, and the game is immediately over. Thre threatening checkmate in one move, and if rook takes, knight takes, check on the move, and now, of course, we can win several ways. This is the simplest, forcing mate the next move. Relatively easy for the top guys to figure this out, but I really wanted you to see the nuances. So the bishop can't move. Queen g6 is a serious threat, and Topalov was thinking what to do, what to do in this position. Now, another defensive try is to offer the queen trade. But obviously, when you're attacking, you don't want to trade. Check is very powerful, followed by rook c4. This bishop, honestly, nobody cares about this bishop. Rook's coming over, queen is trapped. So you see, once the pawn structure around the king is destroyed, this is very difficult to defend. So if rook g8 attacking the queen, white has a very beautiful force in sequence. Knight f7 sacrifice. Queen has to take. Check. Only move is to block with the queen. And now you can probably see mate in two. Check, takes, check mate. And you see how powerful this f6 pawn is? It's extremely, extremely important in white's attack. So let's go back to the game. So the game Tapalov decided to sacrifice the rook for the knight. He already won a bishop. He feels like this knight is really the culprit. It's protecting that f7 push. Okay, rook takes. And now bishop e4. Another idea here is bishop d5, trying to protect the pawn. And here, once again, white has spectacular, spectacular checkmate idea. White is going to go for massive sacrifices. Let's take a look. First, we try to get the king into corner. Now... Obviously, giving the check back is not going to do anything, which is the king goes back. Instead, we need to activate the rooks. So the rook on d6 can't really do anything. The rook on c1 wants to participate. We want to do that. But there's a bishop guard in that square. What do we do, guys? Sacrifice. That's right. You kind of get the idea. Rook c4 anyways. You may say, well, what kind of sacrifice is that? I'm just going to take the rook. And now comes the second sacrifice. So white's going to sacrifice the second rook. Notice that the queen is overloaded piece. This is an overloaded piece sacrifice. The queen has to guard g7, right? If the king, if the queen leaves this rank, there's going to be checkmate. So how can we use the overloading sacrifice? Simple, right? Rook d4. Excellent move. And queen cannot take the rook because of mate. So that's why this is a beautiful sacrifice. And honestly, this position is already lost. There's no defense against this. Things are looking, just looking pretty bad here for black. So anyways, uh, let's go back to this position. So after rook takes, rook takes, bishop e4 was played in the game. 
Anand simply takes with a double idea, attacking the bishop and rook e7. I like this move a lot. Knight d3, trying to activate those knights. Simply rook c2, queen h7. Again, black doesn't mind trading after queen takes, bishop takes, rook takes a6. Black still has a knight and the bishop for the rook. Obviously, most likely he will lose, but there's still some fight left. So f7, x clan. I really like the finishing touch of this game. So queen takes. If rook takes, it's simply mate. And we'll just take either way. So queen has to take. And now, simply rook takes bishop. And at the end of the day, if you count the material, white has rook for two knights. And two extra pawns. Materially, white is actually better. And these pawns are not doing anything at all. The attack, though, is still coming up. Because rook g4 is a serious threat. So black stops at queen f5. And now comes rook e7. Forcing immediate resignation. There's really no way you can stop mate. This is a really weak square. Again, rook here runs into rook f7. And I don't really see any other possibilities. Well, here you can try that. Actually, argue your way that after rook e8, I can play rook f8 back. Yes, I'll buy that argument. But I have a much better way to force checkmate. Again, the queen is overloaded. Protecting the rook and protecting g6 square. Simple sacrifice. Check. Now the rook is overloaded too. You cannot go here because of mate. So queen has to take the rook. Check. King cannot go here because of mate. Only move. Check again. Forcing the king into a check square. And where you, whether you go here or g8 doesn't matter. Mate is coming. Wow. What an amazing, spectacular attack by former world champion Vishay Anand. We're definitely rooting for him, and I hope he's going to continue playing throughout you know, his latter age and show us some brilliant games. Thank you very much. This is Grandmaster Eugene Perlstein. See you all next time.